Welcome everyone. This is Patricia from the International Hospital Federation. Thank you for joining us in our webinar, Improving Healthcare Every Day Through Accreditation. This webinar is being presented by Professor Adrian Pennington, Health Service Chief Executive at White Bay Hospital and Health Service. Adrian has 40 years of healthcare experience and is recognized for his achievements in transformation and quality improvement. He led the coronary heart disease program in the UK, which led to a reduction in mortality of 55,000 lives per annum. With over 40 publications relating to quality and operational improvement, he is widely regarded as a leader in the field of healthcare redesign. Adrian developed the Quality Accounts Framework in England and has worked as an advisor to the Government of British Columbia. He is currently a member of the International Hospital Federation Governing Council and a board member of the Australian Healthcare and Hospitals Association. This year, he was awarded the Australian Health Chief Executive of the Year. Adrian, welcome and thank you for joining us today. We look forward to learning about the short notice accreditation pilot program you implemented. Thank you, Patricia. <clears throat> Um, and, and welcome everybody um, to, to this webinar. It's a first for me, this is a new technology at the, the ripe old age of, of 57. Um, so welcome from the sunny shores of Wide Bay uh, on the uh, mid-Queensland coast in Australia. Um, today I'd like to talk to you about a story that has been one of transformation, one of improvement. Um, it's been a challenging journey, um, but it's also about readying an organisation for changing um, quality improvement on a, on a ready everyday basis that also uh, has wider implications than just for the population of Wide Bay. What we've set out to do uh, within our organisation is to transform the Australian health system and we believe this is the, uh, the early start of that. So I'd like to tell that story um, from different perspectives. I'll also set that in context of what's happening on an international basis in terms of accreditation and explain the different systems and then talk you through where we are in Australia and where I think we're, we're going to go to next. Okay, so with, without further ado, uh, I should say this is a two-year project that we're running. We're, we've just come to the end of the first year. So whilst it's early days, we've had a lot of research done. There's, there's um, a lot of support infrastructure surveys flying around with, for staff all over our organisation and also um, a hospital in Brisbane, which is run by Michael Daly. Uh, Dr. Michael Daly, who's uh, our partner in crime in, in this overall pilot. But Michael's been fantastic in supporting uh, the development of uh, short notice accreditation within the Australian health system. So let's start by looking at uh, accreditation systems and what is accreditation. It, it means different things in, in different parts of the world. But really we're talking about compliance or, or quality certification. It's a means to ensure that, the, that we can measure against agreed set of standards. Now, those standards differ from country to country, but over periods of time, they, they sort of align themselves. So, uh, for example, um, if you'd have been looking 15, 20 years ago, um, we were starting early days then looking at things like C. difficile and MRSA rates, uh, pressure injuries, and all of that seems to be part of everyday um, standards that, 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 that form in, in every country at this, this particular time. When we look uh, again in terms of what the accreditation process does, as an organisation, we're looking for that to, to demonstrate compliance. Uh, so to give an assessment, a compliance against an agreed set of quality standards. And the purpose of that is, is really about the minimisation um, of risk within the organisation and, and the, the need that we all have um, within, the, within the health system not to do any harm to, to anybody that we serve and that be both in public and private uh, facilities. Underpinning that, um, my belief is that um, those organisations that, that tend to, to focus on quality improvement also tend to be very open and transparent in the way in which they report. Uh, and the production of sets of quality accounts or care quality reports on an annual basic, basis underpins uh, and gives that openness and transparency to the, the general communities and, and pa patients and relatives that visit our facilities. So, accreditation systems. In, in Australia, we, we have um, what's best described as a four-year cycle. Um, so every four years, a team of people will come and visit uh, the organisation and assess us against a set of 15 core standards. Within those, there's about two, 250 
um, individual components within each one of those. So they come in and assess us against those, four-year external cycle. In England, um, an annual self-assessment uh, is undertaken again against agreed uh, national standards. In Canada, um, that's the changes. It depends on the states at this moment in time, but between three and five-year cycle, it uh, includes self-assessment and also an optional peer review visit. Uh, New Zealand is a mix, one year mix of both internal and an optional external um, assessment. Germany is totally voluntary, uh, which is quite surprising. Uh, France reduced from four years to two years, very recently, um, with external assessment. UAE and the Middle East and countries tend to have a combination. Um, a lot of it, when I talk about USA-based methodology, tends to be not necessarily accreditation, but the the types of, of quality improvement initiatives that have been developed by such places as John Hopkins and Cleveland Clinic, which are uh, self-developed uh, but with the right intention of, of proven uh, to develop quality improvement within their respective areas. And, and within the USA, there is a, a voluntary system. Um, most of that's undertaken within a, a one-year cycle. Uh, some of that's external assessment um, and in, can include unannounced visits. Quality accounts in, in legislative terms um, was developed in England in 2011, um, rolled into Canada in 2013 under a slightly different name and France 2015. So you can see as, as, as accreditation systems are changing, uh, care quality report type accounts seem to be coming along uh, a, a couple of years behind. So um, what are we looking at when we, when we talk about um, as, assessment? What is the challenge that we face here in Australia? Well, it's, it's cyclical in nature and therefore it only happens periodically. So it's not something that you have to do all the time. It's something that you have to demonstrate. And that's, that's a negative approach to, to accreditation. But unfortunately, there are hospitals in the world that, that have to, to, to have that approach. Um, it's, it's a means of providing evidence, um, but it can be a huge administrative burden leading up to a planned review. Um, people will, uh, chief executives or executive teams will appoint uh, project management teams, um, they'll gather lots of information, a lot of time and effort will be put into place to check policies and procedures and to be able to, to find all the information that underpins and evidences, um, are we really delivering all of these type of things? But again, a, a paper-based process. Most accreditation is, is undertaken um, when it's internal assessment, tends to be by the executive team and a few senior clinicians. Or when there's an external team, it tends to be, again, with, with senior officials, but um, all of these processes tend to be office-based or within boardrooms. It's, it's out, undertaken outside of the clinical area because it involves, um, it doesn't involve patients. It doesn't involve staff delivering frontline services. It's, it's, a, it's a checklist as opposed to um, giving actual evidence. Engagement with the wider, wider workforce is very interesting. In the old accreditation process, the last time we had it here, um, two and a half years ago, there were 12 assessors that visited and they spent less than one hour in theatres in, across three hospitals. And that one hour was actually spent in the, the nurse unit manager's office as opposed to visual evidence uh, recording of staff on the floor. Uh, so just setting that in context. And staff with, certainly from talking to people in my organisation and others within Australia and previously in, in the UK, uh, staff feel that accreditation is something that, that's done in the ivory towers, it's done in the, the, the management corridors, it's not something that they necessarily need to concern themselves about. But in reality, if we care about the quality of service that we, that we provide, it's absolutely imperative that all staff within the organisation are signed up and understand what it is we're trying to achieve. If they, if they don't, the accreditation process means little or nothing, and patients would certainly not benefit. So what we've looked to do with, within our organisation is to, is to understand how we combine day-to-day -day quality improvement activity and the accreditation process. And to do this, this is, it's been a huge cultural shift to take on. Within our organisation, there are 3,800 staff um, spread across a large geographical area, which I'll, I'll show you shortly. Um, but to engage all of those people of every profession has been extremely difficult. Um, but it's really about setting the right aspiration and taking an organisation through a transformational phase before you try to, to look at uh, continuous improvement. So I'll just talk a little bit about Wide Bay. Wide Bay is on the east coast of Australia in Queensland. 
Um, we have two level four hospitals, one level three, a range of, of rural hospitals spread uh, right out towards Gainda and, and on the map you see in front of you. Um, we have mental health facilities, community-based teams, oral health. Most of our patients transfer down to Brisbane for a five-hour journey um, for anything that you perceive as being tertiary-based care. Um, that, could, that could even be within subspecialties for orthopedics, for example, uh, spine, spine surgery or complex hand, uh, shoulder, that, those type of things. It really is level four is really basic acute care management across, across the area. So that's Wide Bay, spread over roughly 200 square kilometres. So the Wide Bay story, back in 2012, when we became a hospital and health service, the Queensland Health System was restructured. Wide Bay was, was seen to be probably the worst performer, well, it was the worst performer at that time. So I just want to set in context um, my early days in arrival. There were 22 executives or people with directors in their title that made up the management team. Um, and it was poor in, in its style and, and, and performance. There was a huge financial deficit of $45 million. Very little engagement with doctors on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, I was here for a couple of months uh, without any, any member of the medical fraternity knocking on my door. You'd have to go and find them to, to have a sensible conversation. And some remarkable figures around waiting times where outpatients was 12 years. Um, for some of the general specialties. Diagnostic, particularly endoscopy, was three and a half year wait, and surgical waiting times in excess of three years. So from a clinical quality perspective, just those type of things give you early warning signs as, as to where we were. And the underpinning clinical governance structure within the organisation spread over a large geography um, was pretty much non-existent, probably the, the, the poorest structure I'd ever seen in, in 40 years. Um, and because of that, all of the above things, it, it would become no surprise that there was no form of quality improvement or engagement in um, improvement activity within the organisation. The range of services, as I mentioned, has been was very basic back then. Um, poor range of services and a lot of people having to transfer back into Brisbane for, for relatively straightforward diagnostic tests. We, we spent back then about $12 million a year just in expenses for patients travelling on trains and cars back into Brisbane. So many, many thousands of patients travelling back into, and in broad terms, we did around 53,000 weighted activity units. Um, that's a, a system that, that is used in Australia to, uh, to enable us to measure one, one unit against another. So this was an organisation that was in need of um, and required extensive transformation, but it needed to be treated with kit gloves. In the previous uh, eight years, there had been seven chief executives. Um, a large number of executives had turned over within the organisation and we needed to find some stability, some belief, some aspiration um, within the organisation to, to, to help us to move forward. Now, cutting that journey short, I'm going to jump straight over to 2018, get a bit Star trek on everybody. Um, so we're going to move forward light years to 2018. And what is, in result terms, comparing those indices, um, a remarkable tra transformation, albeit nowhere near where we need to be. Um, today, I think we are uh, exper we, we're experienced in, in terms of we are looking um, to, to focus on the patient and my, my executive team, which is now smaller, um, is very much focused. My, my CFO, as an example, probably talks more about patients um, than, than, than most EDONs or, or senior medical staff that, are, that I've known. Um, Within the financial environment, from a 45 million deficit, we're now in a very stable position and are currently managing a, a 4 million cumulative surplus. And in that period of time, we've spent roughly $3.4 billion. So a, a good financial result, the, the, the balanced position being the, the ultimate target within a public system. Clinical engagement we're now seeing on all fronts and in improvement activity is 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 good example of that. I recall having conversations with some of our surgeons about why they weren't knocking on the door about endoscopy weights and a, a, a very talented clinical director who's, who's now in a Brisbane hospital, uh, Dr McGregor, uh, explained to me that she didn't really understand or see the information. So um, within the executive, we weren't providing information to show how many people were on a waiting list, how long they were waiting or, or indeed whether, whether any harm was, was, a, was coming as a direct consequence. She engaged in that exercise and we set ourselves a challenge. I asked her a simple question, which was, how long do you think patients need to wait 
before in order for you to be able to to get the best quality outcome. She gave a target of six weeks rather than three and a half years. Uh, so we set about uh, delivering that challenge and as a direct consequence of Denise's early work with the surgical team uh, here in Bundaberg and spread to Fraser Coast, um, that had an impact on wider uh, waiting lists and the engagement of clinicians because it became about what they thought was clinically practical and safe as opposed to what we wanted to do as, as managers or um, as, as politicians within our system. Um, it really was, was about how do we identify what is best for patient and deliver it uh, and aspire to, to, to do that. So today our outpatient waiting times are down to nine months and falling, so that's from 12 years. Um, diagnostic waiting times endoscopy is down to 12 weeks from three and a half years. And we haven't had a single death uh, on that endoscopy waiting list for, for nearly four and a half years now. Um, surgical waiting times are down to six months. These waiting times in the public system in Australia, um, it's our belief that they're actually the lowest in each category in, in the whole of the country. So a remarkable turnaround. Clinical governance structure has been well developed. We changed the team. We had to change the, the whole philosophy. And to a large extent, that's been, been copied across the state. But clinical governance, uh, in my view, is, is a structure that underpins an organisation. It's a support service, the way in which finance is, the way in which HR is. Clinical governance activity, as opposed to structure and support, is really what uh, our clinical staff deliver on a day-to-day -day basis, the way in which they deliver it, and, and the, the enthusiasm and the standard and the quality of, of, of what they deliver. So the separation of the two is, is really important. So we, we, we then had extensive quality improvement programs. We, we delivered that through targeted work in, in waiting list areas and emergency services. We also looked at uh, the reprovision of new services, repatriating back from, from Brisbane um, through to uh, developing specific uh, types of methodology using lean and, and sigma techniques and, and various other means. Introducing new services, pediatric ENT, radiation oncology, medical oncology, ophthalmology, cardiac, uh, including um, public sector patients being treated within uh, for angiogram and stenting. Um, that may seem uh, relatively straightforward for many people around the world, but when you live in regional Queensland and you're five hours away uh, in an ambulance or a, a one and a half hour away from a helicopter, if there's one available, that's particularly important to, to localise those type of services in terms of outcome. We've had a, a, an extensive expansion of telemedicine and this is about accessing our rural areas where we're, we're, we're 350, 400Ks inland, uh, making sure that we can deliver chemotherapy uh, through a telehealth mechanism uh, from the central hospitals um, today. Uh, so patient travel now really is within Y Bay. It's, it's about patients really traveling for what is very important, um, those, those serious end specialties that you need to undertake a given volume just to be, just to be considered an expert. So your cardiac surgery or your transplantation, those, those type of facilities. And, and um, in terms of activity, today we do 92,000 units of activity. So in that transformation, that, that change, the inspiration, that, uh, the aspiration that, that clinicians have, um, everybody's become more productive. We still have the same number of staff that we did back in 2012, 3,800. Um, but we've moved from 53,000 units of activity to 92,000 in the same place. So we've become engaged, we're ready as an organisation, and staff within our organisation are, are ready for a, a, a bigger uh, challenge. And this is where we move to uh, in terms of um, you know, what, what, what uh, accreditation is all about. So what's happened in those five years, uh, early wins of clinical engagement, we also developed a plan. We talked with our community, we talked with our staff uh, in a full public consultation over a 12-week period and developed a four-year strategic plan. So everybody was engaged in it. We developed business skills of all of our senior managers and, and first-line deputies, um, developed quality standards, not necessarily associated with accreditation, um, but for each specialty within the organisation so that uh, our own clinicians could directly relate to what was important from a quality from a, a specific specialty perspective. And that's really important. Underpinning all of that, you have to have project management infrastructure to, to be able to support it. Um, we created um, initially uh, a number of committees that aligned to the four-year accreditation cycle. That didn't feel like it was enough. Um, but evolving those groups from being reactive, i.e. preparing for a four-year cycle and being proactive 
um, preparing for to be ready on an everyday basis. We had to align the workforce. Uh, this was really about increasing um, the number of clinicians within our organisation and decreasing uh, backroom staff. Obviously, for reduced waiting times, you no longer need 20, 30 people staff managing waiting lists because you can get clinicians and do the work. So you need less people, your waiting lists are smaller. Simple processes that, that you can change uh, in doing that. We became very transparent. We've be, been very open in our reporting. There are no surprises if we make a mistake. I'll be the first to, to put my hand up as chief executive. And um, that's reported through uh, within the health system and certainly through to our, our board. Um, the aspiration, I believe, of our staff within the organisation has, has, has changed totally. Um, with, when I look back from 2012, people didn't believe that I or some of the executives I brought would, would stay more than a year. Um, but people have become innovative, they've become creative, they're striving to achieve that next step toward excellence. If, if we could ever uh, define what excellence looks like, it seems to be a changing goalpost. And of course, we're, we're focused on, on the patient. Um, so now we can move into what, what is ready every day compared to the current accreditation process. So I just talked briefly, two and a half years ago, we went through a full accreditation of all our facilities across the whole of Wide Bay. So a five-day process, 12 external assessors turned up, uh, very mob-handed. It felt very um, challenging, just all of those people coming, coming, coming into our, our organisation. But we were given three months' notice we, of the exact date when they would arrive. So that enabled us to prepare. But we could forecast 12 months out. We knew our time was up, that you had to be accredited within that time period. So 12 months real notice, but 12 months actual of the defined date. So at that time, we would get into project management focus. We would recheck all of our standards, recheck all of our procedures. We'd go through making sure evidence had been recorded. And uh, uh, we'd have a whole, sh whole schedule of meetings covering every standard um, with the assessors. And, and this was all done as part of team preparation and getting evidence ready for that um, big, big, big week uh, of assessment. So during the assessment period, four days, uh, with the assessors are actually spent in meetings. The review is um, very little is compliance is actually witnessed in the true sense. I was talking to a, a senior colleague recently about nursing standards and I said, my, one of my concerns is when you look at, at nursing audits, um, on average people seem to be 74 or 75% compliant with uh, even checking somebody for pressure care on a day-to-day -day basis. That's a, that's a measure in paper records or even digital records within the system, uh, where nurses will say that they've, they've, they've done it 99%. That's, that's one individual. It's not evidence uh, or that, that it's really happening. And what we need to do is to create something in an environment where people can be witnessed and seen visually, and not just be prescribed uh, on a piece of paper. And we've certainly seen evidence of, of hospitals around the world in, in different countries where uh, information's been pro provided that's been false, that's given a wrong impression about an organisation and things become much worse over an accreditation site. So we, were, we need to create something different. And on day five of the current process, um, the, the accreditation team present back to the organisation to a full executive, to all heads of departments in the organisation and really hold you to account. It's very school teacherish. It's, it's uh, this is what you've done well, this is what you need to do. And they can serve, you know, 90 day notices of any failings to say, if you haven't done this by, by 90 days time, then, uh, you know, you could technically be shut down. Um, but the, the, the next stage of that when they leave, even if you have a 90 day notice, which is, which is, which is a good thing, the, the way in which that is closed is not visual again, it's not by a visit. It tends to be an email exchange that gives clarity that you have provided that evidence and, and therefore it can be signed off. So, we passed our accreditation two and a half years ago. A lot of my the two people in our organisation were really excited. They're, this is fantastic. It's the first time as a whole hospital and health service we've, we've got full accreditation. But I and, and many of the executives, we, we felt quite disappointed by the whole process. We, we, we were challenging ourselves in terms of what have we achieved? Do we feel like we've improved the quality of care through the process that we've been through? Has it improved things from you know, from a patient's perspective or have staff benefited, they weren't even involved in the process. And 
in reputational terms, yes, we've got a badge that we can stick at the front of a hospital that says we've been assessed, um, but it didn't feel qualitative. So we wanted to develop something new, and we put our minds to um, designing that. And, and unbeknown to us at the time, there was an, another team led by a man called Michael Daly, Dr. Michael Daly in Logan Hospital in Brisbane, who was doing something similar. So we were developing at this stage a, a new accreditation process that would have real impact. We'd already used it within our strategic plan, the ready every day a compliance thing, but we wanted to, to, to contest that if we had an announced visit, would we still be able to achieve this? And could we measure uh, against any standard in any facility um, if really challenged uh, in an unexpected way? And were the standards, procedures, compliance, is that really evidence? Um, if we took all of that information and we just put it all onto a website, including the paper evidence, then why would an assessor even need to come to the organisation? If, if they're not visibly going to assess anything, is there any real point? It should just be a paper exercise and we should not pretend it's anything other than that. So we needed to change that. And we were thinking initially, rather than spending all day in meetings, in an assessment week, two and a half years ago, I spent the whole week, literally the whole week, in meetings with different assessors talking about different standards. So we wanted to change that so that no more than two or three people would be engaged from our organisation in the first few visits uh, for nothing more than 15 minutes with an assessment team. And then we wanted them to actually get out onto the floor to talk to staff in our wards and our theatres and our pharmacy and our warders and our catering staff and, and ask um, them, you know, were they compliant? Did, were they aware of the standard? Were they living? Were they breathing it on a day-to-day -day basis? This is, this is what is, is real quality of care. So we needed to develop a system that engages all staff, and I mean all staff, in quality activity and to be ready on an everyday basis. Um, we needed to promote and understand um, what all of that meant to a wide range of people. Um, so in order to develop this, we had to write up the process, we had to engage partners, and that's where we came in with uh, Dr. Michael Daly's team, and we put together a joint initiative, um, predominantly with um, the Australian Council of Health Service Standards, um, to uh, develop a, a two-way process of one as to how, how can we prepare for something like this, and from ACHS's perspective, what would this look like in real terms? They would have to retrain assessors because they'd be doing things in a different way. Um, and we needed the Australian Commission for Health and Safety to underpin and support this pilot because it would change, certainly for the two organisations involved, that my, my hospital and health service and, and Michael's hospital down in, in, in South Metro. Um, we needed to, to be able to opt out of the current four-year cycle and, and, and take on this challenge. So the pilot was agreed and Queensland Health very kindly uh, underpinned and funded uh, a very extensive research project that's been running alongside us since we started in August um, last year, 2017. So within Wide Bay, I'll tell that story. If Michael was here, I'm sure he'd have similar stories to tell uh, from Logan's perspective. Uh, but this is really from a Wide Bay perspective. Um, so we've had Although there are 10 national main standards and five developmental standards, we've had 26 standards looked at, so repetitively, in different hospitals at different times. There have been three major visits um, with teams of around five assessors, um, no notice given at all uh, in the real sense. When I say that, that's a phone call to say we'll be here tomorrow. Um, and uh, it, it depends how you, you respond to that, which I'll come on to. Um, Five-day visits of, of those teams, um, roughly 80% of their time has been spent at the point of care. So only 20% spent in, in the initial visits with, with my teams uh, of senior executives and just ticking off some of those early things about was all the paperwork on the websites that enabled them to, to get down. The most recent visit, um, really interesting, uh, we got a phone call, I instructed all senior executives and clinical governance people within our organisation to stand down. Um, they, they knew the assessment was going to take place the following day. Nobody got involved, nobody turned up at the hospitals and the departments that were under review. And the assessors were allowed to work directly on the floor with teams of people. And they came away uh, not only with, with doing 100% assessment at the point of care, um, but with an absolute green card in terms of, of, of outcome, which 
couldn't have made me more proud in terms of uh, th those individuals' activity and, and the way in which they responded. And the assessors felt the same way. So early, early problems um, that you face is that obviously assessors looking at the floor will find more things, and that's what's great about this. They find things today, and you can make that change overnight, and you can ask them to go back and have a look. Um, we had some issues within our theatres in one of our hospitals where on, on one day they spent six hours, a team of five people, spent six hours in our theatres watching staff in every theatre and looking at the anaesthetic process, the nursing staff, the, the uniforms, the, the, the hygiene, everything was being assessed. And then on the second day, because they found some issues, on the second day they went back for three hours and on the third day they went back for one hour. So by the time the cycle of accreditation was, was complete around this area, all staff were engaged, they'd made improvements, they were, they were doing things that they'd been um, really prevented from doing under the old system. Uh, so it enabled us to, to make early improvement. Uh, so staff engagement across the organisation, little involvement of the executive team, uh, zero preparation, you know, the, gone are the, the, the six month projects and checks of executive teams, are you sure we've got everything in place? It's an assumption, we have everything in place and, and, and we stay that way. Assessors are enjoying the process. They come here and it's not a long, laborious process and uh, getting weighed down in, in spreadsheets and analytics. It's, it's genuinely about that visibility of watching and evidencing that even our evidence sheets, that they are true and a fair reflection. Um, if, if changes that we'd, ha we'd undertaken in the last year, if we were under the, the four-year cycle, we probably wouldn't have been addressing those until that cycle started in two years' time. So early change, early intervention, really important. Value add in terms of improvements cross-checked across the organisation. Lessons learned from an assessment in one hospital can be shared with another. So across our hospital and health service, we've been sharing activity and, and improvement. And the cost of accreditation is, is, is just minimal. Um, in fact, the last one was, was zero. Um, other than um, basically the, the, the coffee and tea for assessors who, who, who came. The, it was their time and effort that was uh, more, more, more expensive. And, and patient time and service is, is minimised in terms of interruption. Uh, management get on with a job, uh, we run the business as, as we should do on a day-to-day -day basis, nothing slows down, everything improves. So here's some, some early research indicators um, as I come toward the end of, of, of this outline. 86% of staff prefer, prefer the, the new format, the Ready Every Day accreditation, the short notice accreditation process. 91% of information uh, is immediately available to surveyors. I believe that's near a 98, 99 if we were to survey at this moment in time, so we're improving. 84% of staff available to answer effectively questions. So stopping people on the floor and actually, can you tell me about this? Or can you tell me about the lock on this cabinet or the drug? Uh, here or, or this piece of equipment. Staff being able to, to give their own training record, people engaged in the process. 74% of staff believe the new press process was more time efficient, uh, which is interesting because a, a lot of people um, weren't even involved. They, they just knew that it was a burden on the senior people and that uh, common norm within an organisation is if, if the boss said it's, it's a long laborious process, it must be boring and time consuming, so everybody thinks it is. <coughs> within the, the assessment team, the 12 assessors within our organisation that have, have come to, to assess, 11 of the 12 uh, believe that to the review to be far more efficient. Uh, interestingly, the one that didn't um, was, was, came from a medical fraternity and wanted to uh, very much check uh, wider analytics on a, a specialty basis. 46% um, decrease in stress level of a survey, uh, that's not all directly related to me, but um, uh, definitely it, it, it changes, it gives you a greater and better mindset on a day-to-day -day basis. It's less disruptive, 84% uh, uh, supported that. 67% increase in, in surveyor understanding of the organisation, so it's really important and when measuring against a, an agreed uh, predetermined set of standards that you understand how that relates to the way in which an organisation is set up. And different organisations structure in different ways because of the maturity of the organisation at a given point in time. Sometimes we might be in turnaround, so the focus is, is, is very much different. Uh, staff supported the accuracy of the findings of the assessment, 80% of surveyors confident in recommendations. Staff behaving 
uh, believed to, to have improved care immediately as part of the assessment process. So that's really, really good feedback, early, early improvement. 80% reduction in cost of the accreditation process. Um, and, and next steps really, um, within the accreditation process, so there's another 12 months to complete the pilot. Um, continued evaluation, that's changing all the time. We've got to look more at behaviours and, and compliance through that, that, that visual thing. Um, research reporting will probably be around 12 to 15 months for, for the final report, but we'll be updating the wider community. Interestingly, the, the Australian Commission for Health and Safety, they've been, you know, a lot of people are aware of this type of work, a lot of people want to do this type of work, and they're forever being approached about, you know, when can we change, when can we get involved in this type of thing. So the Commission have now looked and is launched on the website to uh, introduce this from the 1st of January on a voluntary basis, but obviously that has to be limited in terms of everybody can't change. And, and to be fair, my advice would be, you have to have completed a four-year cycle to, to be in a position where it gives you confidence that you can move forward and, and get into a ready everyday uh, situation. A lot of interest from uh, many other countries, which is, is witnessed even by this, the, this webcast today with 27 countries on, online. Um, we're looking at further development, so we're not stopping and just trying to complete this. We're already looking to, to do more things. We're looking at a thing called ready everyday nursing at the moment, which is how we can understand how nurses can be compliant against a full range of nursing standards on a day-to-day -day basis and transition training uh, into the workplace with hands-on patient training uh, and compliance right down to the way in which we interact with patients, how we, how we confirm that patients understand what they've been told, what's going to happen to them, what they do. The, the Kate Granger, my name is, and seeing through patients' eyes um, how care should be delivered, that, that whole approach. So it's my belief that this, this whole system is, is going to evolve in a rapid way over the next 12, 24 months and um, potentially on a, on a wider scale than, than Australia. I believe it will become mandatory in Australia, certainly within two to three years. Um, so we're, we're proud and, and I know Michael's team are proud that um, a relatively small scale project that's transitioned into standard practice within our own organisation could be something that's, um, you know, could impact on the, the, the rest of Australia and potentially other countries. So, um, you know, the, the, the work and time and effort that our teams put in will have a genuine impact on, on people around the, around the world. So from my, my perspective and Wide Bay, and um, just to tie up that loose end, in terms of our next steps, we have a number of things to do. We're, we're currently working on business cases for a, an upgraded hospital. So some of those specialties that we've mentioned, bringing those all together into one centre in, under, under a new roof. Um, thinking about university status and the development of a, a medical school so we can homegrown doctors that are focused on um, caring for people that, that they know and, and, and uh, uh, are friends with. Um, wider development of academic uh, science centres, that's it's old news if you're in Canada and, and the UK. They've, they've done this a lot with allied health and nursing and wider medical schools, but we need to develop uh, that direct association to home grow stuff in, in regional Queensland. Uh, expanding our oral health teaching, which we, we've introduced. Um, we're developing business school. Now we're, uh, we're looking at MBA programs for our, our top 250 people um, of both clinical background and, and managerial. So it's important to... Um, to be able to bring people in that are relatively young and inexperienced and, and educate them academically as well as from an experienced perspective. Underpin all of that obviously with a research academy and a research campus um, and we're looking at how uh, a lot of this can be integrated with uh, private hospitals that we work closely with. Some of the services we provide we subcontract within a private environment so um, some of our services are already integrated but we need to, to look at how we can get greater economies of scale uh, greater improvement of a quality perspective by, by greater dual management. And when all of that's done, hopefully this will all be complete in about five, six, seven years' time, and that will be the end of, of my health career. And uh, hopefully Wide Bay will be um, uh, famous for, for many things, but most, improve, most importantly, for changing the quality of care for the population within Wide Bay that just happen to make a difference for people elsewhere. And with that, I'll draw my presentation to a close. Thank you, Patricia.
Thank you, Adrian. Uh, we'll start reading some questions from the audience shortly. Uh, just to remind everyone, you can send your questions by typing them in the Q&A tab found at the bottom of your Zoom webinar screen. Uh, so before we proceed with the questions from the audience, I have a few questions. Um, so Adrian, what has been your involvement in accreditation as chief executive since the short notice accreditation started? That's a good question, Patricia. I, I, it, it's really changed. So in the early days when, when we're developing uh, this work, um, you know, the, the two teams worked together with, with ACHS and our chief executive there, Christine Dennis, a very innovative lady. Um, we, we've worked as a, as a tripart to, to really understand how to make this successful. So uh, in the early days, uh, in terms of system process, um, a lot of time, um, and when I say a lot of time from a chief executive perspective, you know, potentially up to a week a month. Um, but since we've been into short notice accreditation re in real time, um, you know, short notice accreditation took place last month in two of my hospitals. I never saw the assessors, I never spoke to them, I didn't need to. Um, it, it's, it really is changing. Um, obviously, if we received, you know, a notification that we weren't compliant with something, that notification would come to me as chief executive, and we'd have to, to put together a plan to, to rectify that. But it, it really is about being serious in, and sincere in that if, if you don't believe that you can deliver it every day, you shouldn't, shouldn't play it. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, one more question. Do you think the costs are genuine saving or time releasing? It, it's a combination. Um, I think, yes, we, we did spend a lot of money on, on preparation, um, and, and I think most hospital and health services within the Australian health system do, um, whether that be in project focus, moving people around that have to be backfilled. It, it's, a, it's a genuine increase in cost. Um, but in terms of, of, of what's been released, it's not just that cost, it's also, you know, it's my time. You know, I've got more time to get on with ensuring that we're delivering on things strategic within our organisation. So it's accelerating the progress of other things within the organisation at, at a rapid rate. Of, of most people within the, the management and senior clinical um, uh, structure within our organisation. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, how does short notice accreditation fit into the bigger picture of quality improvement? I, I, yeah, this is, this is a good question. I, I think we, we need to understand what, what accreditation is for. And I mentioned this right at the beginning, that clinical governance structures, um, if, if you take somewhere like John Hopkins or, or Cleveland Clinic or some of the larger uh, renowned organizations with, within the world, they, they very much have set their own standards. They look at their own data and create standards um, that, that measures for their own benefit and value. They, they want, they're looking to improve all the time. What we tend to do when we're developing accreditation systems through government um, uh, initiatives, they tend to be uh, less focused. They're, they're not as aspirational uh, as maybe they should be um, because there's a limit to what, what can be achieved or, or, or delivered. Um, so, so there's a reasonableness about the way in which they're, they're developed. Um, and they change over time. So people, um, just as you get used to something, then they're changing something, they're evolving. Um, so I, I think there are two things that run in parallel. Your clinical governance structure, the engagement of your clinician should be about a wider set of indicators that is giving them insight into their own business, both from a qualitative and a, and a business perspective, clinical perspective. Um, but the, the accreditation is there to uh, to give assurance, it's, it's that final check against a, a core range of standards, uh, albeit for almost every standard that, that um, there is within the national framework, we probably have 10 or 15 that are, are subsets of that. And it's that detail thing that's, that's probably more important because it's a pyramid effect. The top standard is important to deliver, but without the intricacy of the detail, you, you can't deliver genuine quality improvement. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, Brian is asking, to what extent do you believe your early wins with clinician engagement were related to the reaction to the Bundaberg Hospital issues in the first decade, decade of this century? It's uh, a good question, Brian. I, 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 I don't think it uh, did. I, I think what happened um, in Bundaberg uh, all those years ago, um, what, what tends to happen when there's any crisis in healthcare in any, any health systems, and I, you know, I was involved partially in the Mid-Staffs Review in, in the UK, um, 
and you know one of the reasons I wanted to come to to Wide Bay was because I, I saw it as a challenge. Um, clinicians within the organisation, um, most of them weren't around in in, in those days. Um, but what what had happened, um, which was disappointed, uh, almost too much recess had been had been thrown at the facility. So. You know, we had people coming out of our ears that were professing to be experts, hence 22 executives at the time. Um, everybody was an expert of everything, rather than uh, trying to get a smaller number of people that were really focused, that could work with clinicians and, and support and, and enable them to improve. Most clinicians want to deliver the right thing. They're all trained to deliver the right thing. The supporting infrastructure is very much dependent on management to, to resolve. They, they, they can't transform that. So it, it has to be a partnership. And uh, I don't believe that our clinicians have been offered that uh, or been challenged or even asked the, the, you know, an opinion as to what do you think is the right thing to do from a patient's perspective. That's a very different question from a politician. And no offence to any politicians anywhere in the world, but you know whether you've been... Um, you know, you set an 18-week clinical pathway target, a one-year surgical target, or a, or a five-year target. That they're political targets. If you talk to clinicians and ask them what you know, they train to be doctors to do the right thing for, for patients. Not seeing somebody for two, three years cannot be acceptable ethically in in any system in the world. So, uh, if you're prepared to underpin and support a clinician, um, they will respond. And uh, so, so I don't think there's any any relationship at all. And certainly today, um, those those days are long past. And uh, I'm I'm proud of what this organisation's achieved over the over the last five years. Thank you, Adrian. Brian is also asking: Is the experience more reflective of a change in the organisation's culture than a revision in the intent of accreditation? Uh, one one feeds the other. Um, so, so I, I think you have to prepare an organisation. Um, you, you know, if we'd have taken the organisation in 2012 and, and said, short notice accreditation, we'll sort this out. So we'll devise a, a process and it will sort everything out, all the problems that we had back then. It wouldn't have achieved it. What would have happened is the assessment team probably would have burst into tears and, and served, you know, a hundred or so AC90s on us, um, and many people would have. Um, moved on in the process. It, it, it really was about putting some aspiration into the organisation, getting some early wins, getting some spirals, um, giving encouragement to people. There's a lot of capable people in the organisation that uh, hadn't had chance to, to demonstrate what they were capable of. And, and we brought in a lot of you know, experienced, capable people to complement that. So it, it's, it's been fantastic. Um, so the early part, the early transformation, is really important and you have to be in a particular state to genuinely say that you are ready every day and therefore ready available to do short notice accreditation. If, if you're not prepared and, and your people aren't engaged, you, you will fail miserably. Thank you, Adrian. Mimi is asking, does this model also help improve the processes for accreditation of specialist training posts? Indirectly, yes, it would do. Um, uh, I, I mean, there's there's great clarification, uh, certainly in terms of process and evidence. Um, you know, whilst I, I mentioned about ready everyday nursing, we're also looking at concepts around ready everyday uh, for for doctors, looking at different stages, both from medical students through uh, internships, JHOs, registrar to to even SMO. In terms of what do you need to have in play to, to to be compliant to to encourage to ensure that people are being trained in the right way on a regular basis and supported given that rotation that um, people within the structure get chance to develop people in different ways we don't want all of our juniors learning from one particular doctor they have to experience different people they have to work with different people to get different ideas and different different perceptions of, as to, to to what can be done um, so, so yes, indirectly, I think it has improved um, the, 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 re the engagement and responsiveness of, of medical staff across our organisation. Thanks, Adrian. Bernie is asking, does the short notice survey method have any similarities to the Care Quality Commission in the UK? No. Uh, so the Care Quality Commission predominantly um, uh, runs um, using a one-year uh, cycle 
um, it's it's very much self-assessment. Um, and when it depends on the outcome of your self-assessment, which are reporting back to the Care Quality Commission, the the commission then responds by sending teams in, but it tends to be reactive to those that have declared non-compliance, as opposed to checking that those that have said they're compliant are really compliant. And um, I, I think there lies a danger that sometimes when you have organisations under pressure, and, and anybody from the UK of Lyme would, would, would agree with me that the, the National Health Service in, in England is under extreme financial pressure at this moment in time, and has been for a number of years. Uh, and whilst you're going through those type of things, um, it's really difficult because people are, are cutting back at the, that last bit um, that it starts to impact on the quality of care that you deliver. And um, there's a tendency for uh, the more weaker management teams to, to be able to tick a box that necessarily shouldn't be ticked. Thank you, Adrian. Elizabeth is asking, what key dynamics in quality have you seen change over the past five years for the better? I think in, in engagement, um, as, aspiration is, is, it's a wonderful thing to say, um, but, but you can see it. You know, I, I remember using the example I gave of Dr. McGregor, when we were talking about delivering a six-week endoscopy way. Um, we went away, we did it, we worked it all out. And six months later, we'd gone from three and a half years to six weeks. So everybody thought it was fantastic. All the clinicians were, were on board. But, but I remember Denise coming to my office and literally she stormed the Bastille. It was, um, Adrian, I've, I've looked at the surgical waiting time data and I've looked at the outpatient waiting data and I thought, Christ, I've created a monster, you know? Uh, this, this person uh, wanted to know about everything and all of a sudden it was, this isn't acceptable, that's not acceptable. And that's... That's about how you create that um, belief that, that there's one thing to have aspiration, that it's another to actually believe that it can be achieved. And when you put the two together, in, in my view, provide with the right support, there is nothing that can't be achieved. In, in any business, it, it, you know, that applies wider, it's not just to health, but health is particularly complex because we have you know, a number of variables and that is the way in which clinical teams perform and everybody we treat is very different. So we're unlike any other business in the world. Thank you, Adrian. Sally is asking, when you said that the accredit accreditors spend 80% of their time in the clinical areas, does that mean that they visited 80% of the sites or it was a measure of time spent for a large organization going to 80% of the areas would take no, time? No, that's, that's, that's a, a good question, Sally, for clarification. Um, it, it was about the, the time the assessors, assessors spent. So they were here for five days uh, in the first assessment, five days in the second assessment. So during those 10 days, roughly 80% of their time was spent out on the floor uh, working with um, people at, at, at front line and about 20% was spent back in room. So still at, at that time in the early uh, short notice accreditation, there was still too much uh, chatter, if you like, and discussion taking place in offices, which didn't need to happen. So, but 80% was a fantastic improvement. And that the latest one um, was uh, we had two assessors uh, attend over a two-day period, and that was 100%. Um, so really 100% the assessors at the front line. So that's, that's the significant difference. It's, it's genuine evidence of visually I've seen, lived and breathed this with staff. I can see that they, they understand what they're doing and, and I've watched them deliver it. Thanks, Adrian. Um, we have a question from Adam. Uh, big beasts or systems are inherently slow to turn. So what have been and what do you foresee as being the greatest bureaucratic challenges to implementing an agile process such as this? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, the, um, the size of the organization um, within White Bay, it, it, it is a big organization. It's made more complex by the geography. You know, just to get from one hospital to another driving is, is two, two and a half hours drive. Um, so for executives and senior leaders, it's hard to get around the patch uh, on, a, on a regular basis, let alone be discussing and having those conversations with, with, with people. So it, it, it really has been communication underpins, uh, good communication underpins most successful organizations using technology, but being a heads of department meeting, having everybody dial in from different parts, no matter where, as chief executive, I can speak from anywhere. You know, I could, I could actually be away on a trip in Brisbane and yet still speak to every department within the organization providing the IT frameworks there. 
So I, I, I think it, it is about preparing the organization the right way um, by thinking through what, you know, what are the challenges, understanding the restrictions, uh, understanding and, and restrictions from the perspective of both the physical and the mental, um, but, but also from a clinical perspective as to and going back to that belief thing, if people don't believe they can do it, it doesn't matter if you change the, uh, the, the, the physical and the, the, the numbers of people and, and all of that type of thing. Um, it, it has to be a whole system approach. And you have to have the right people to deliver it. You know, I, I happen to think I've got one of the best executive teams um, in public health system. I've worked with some fantastic executives over 40 years. But the team I have today is, is probably the best I've ever had. And, uh, you know, four or five of them could easily be chief execs in their own right. But they all give a damn about what we're trying to achieve here and they want to succeed. And, and I think our senior clinicians within the organisation are of the same ilk. They're, they're bought into, uh, you know, the, the long game. It's, it, it's, not, it's not about the next six months. It's not about survival. It's about genuine improvement. Thanks, Adrian. So one last question from Alex. The short notice accreditation focus more on process than results. For example, related to pressure area care, if staff demonstrate great pressure area care of patients, but the number of pressure injuries remains high, do you still get a please explain because of the result? Uh, yes. Uh, in the, well, no, yes and no. In the, it, it, that's a difficult question because the, the assessment is really about um, one, do you have a system in play? Um, and two, um, are people enacting that? If people aren't enacting it, then you're non-compliant. And there's usually a reason for the non-compliance. That may be um, an indicator, maybe a subset of that, where they would look at uh, the training as to whether people have done um, you know, pressure care management on a, on a day-to-day -day basis. Is there evidence of that? Is it recorded in the notes? There's a, there's a whole range of, uh, of subsets that would prove whether just because you've got a policy and, and and uh, a procedure in play and you've provided evidence that you're 100% compliant in the last six months. If the assessors in the short notice accreditation process saw um, that there was still a high level of pressure care management, they would still go and assess and they would probably tell us the reason why. We would already know as an organisation to be fair, so I, I would know if, if our training rate, rates dropped for, for pressure injury management, um, you know, then the probability is the, the the, the numbers presented would increase. Um, but likewise, it's interesting that what you perceive as a serious incident, I, I recall in 2012, an endoscopy patient, um, there's four categories of, of, of patient, urgent, um, relatively urgent, and, and basically elective. And the targets for those in Australia uh, were 30, 60, and uh, 365 days, sorry, 30, 90, and 365 days. Back in 2012, even a category one, sorry, a category four patient that had waited a year wasn't considered a serious incident. Now, that's, that's really, in real terms, that's a referral from a GP suggesting that an individual may have cancer. So the way in which the organisation is structured today, that if we have one patient that goes over that 30 days, it automatically triggers. Uh, you know, people will come together and find out what is going on. Um, it just shouldn't happen. Uh, so, so the whole philosophy of the organisation has transformed and we respond very early to any change in pattern of performance within the organisation anyway. Uh, so hopefully that should happen before assessors, but if assessors find something, then, you know, we put our hands up, we respond and, and, and we put right. Great. Thank you, Adrian. Um, and thank you, everyone, who sent in their questions. If you think of any additional questions later on, you can contact Adrian through the contact details displayed on your screen. Uh, before we end the webinar, Adrian, is there anything else you want to say to our attendees? No, I'd just like to, to thank everybody for joining us today on behalf of uh, Wide Bay Hospital Health Service um, and also the International Hospital Federation. Um, it's great that people could come in from so many countries to, to share this story. Um, obviously, we're only halfway through. There's a lot, more, a lot of lessons to learn, um, and I'm sure our direction will change and, and, and improve the overall process before uh, others follow. Um, and hopefully, that will be for, for, for the good of many people. So, thank you all for, for joining us, and uh, hopefully, we'll see you all in, in about six months' time. 
Thank you again, Adrian. Uh, we at the IHF really appreciate that you took the time to share about your accreditation pilot program. I know that our attendees benefited a lot from your presentation. Uh, we'd also like to thank everyone for joining the webinar today. We will be posting the video recording on our website next week. Uh, and we hope you can join us again in our future webinars. We also hope to see you all at the IHF World Hospital Congress taking place on 10 to 12 October in Brisbane, Australia. That is uh, being hosted by the Australian Healthcare and Hospital Association. Um, thank you, and I hope you all have a great morning, afternoon, and evening ahead of you. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Patricia. Bye.